Welcome to Gold Derby's costume design panel. I'm David Buchanan, um, and I'm here with Susan Michalik from Abbott Elementary. Susan, I wanted to start by asking you, you've worked on so many comedy series and sitcoms in your career. What do you love most about the genre, and what is most unique about Abbott versus anything else you've worked on? Well, I love it because it's happy. They're happy and fun and colorful and have joy in them, and also sentimentality and sweetness. And Abbott, um, in particular, we try to do it from um, price points that teachers could afford. We're trying to shop the show at, you know, and sometimes I fail at that, but at lower price points and trying to do it with um, fun, you know, color and sort of what they really wear, but amplify it. And uh, that is is exciting after years of just buying designer stuff and, you know, sort of doing a different vibe for a really long period of time, trying to change the um trajectory. And also the show is just uh, Quinta Brunson who created it is so wonderful and there's so much love involved in the process of it that it's really fun to do. Yeah, I imagine. And let's talk about Quinta and Janine in particular, because in season yeah. three, you know, we've seen her kind of fashion and style evolution over the three seasons. And then as she moves to the district, that's a big change for the series this season. Yeah. You know, her, her fashion has changed so dramatically. Um, I wanted to ask you about, you know, what was the inspiration for those looks? How did you craft those looks with Quinta? And over the course of, you know, these these past few seasons, just to watch that evolution unfold. Well, at first, I mean, nothing fit. So we deliberately, you know, wore these long dresses and turtlenecks and baggy stuff that was just sort of cinched in with a belt. And um, uh, Quinta has a very uh, significant and strong voice in what she wears, justifiably so. She puts together a lot of the outfits herself. I shop them and we, you know. And then for the the glow up in season three, everything now fits, which is fantastic. And so it's shorter, tighter, uh, more professional. She's growing up, the character's growing up, kind of has the same undertone to it. I originally uh, started with sort of uh, looking at Instagram feeds of teacher style and trying to pick up on that, but do happier one, you know, happy. Yeah, we've also got new characters at the district yeah. season, which is so exciting when, you know, you have an established series and get to introduce a bunch yeah. of fun new folks. What was the inspiration for how they would dress and how did you want to make that universe distinct from, you know, the the teachers at Abbott who we spend so much time with? Well, all the district employees were all meant to look young and kind of um, inspiring and relevant and youthful within Philly and also sort of realistic within the price points they wore. And um, it was a lot of fun to do them just to sort of uh, counter the teachers to have something new. Yeah, what's great about Abbott too is, you know, we spend a lot of time in the in the school, of course, but we also get to see a lot of these teachers outside of the classroom setting and that's where we really get to see their fashion in a different sense and how they express themselves differently. Um, you know, we have a great, um, great segments outside of the classroom all the time in the season. So what, where do you get your inspiration for how they should look when they're not dressing for work? Um, you know, between Jacob is moving in with uh, Mrs. Shimenti, their roommates yeah. now, we get to see them at home. It's so much fun. Like what, how do you kind of go about figuring out what they should wear when they're not teaching and, and looking, you know, professional? Well, I I really need to go into the stores and see what's there and scan uh, websites. And I really search for the thing that I think pops. And so I just go through a lot and bring a lot in and look at it. And I also talk to the actors about when they have a shift, when the costume is something different outside of school. I talk to them about what they might want. And that in, uh, gives me input also. Yeah, we had a wonderful episode recently, Mother's Day. And I wanted to ask you a couple of um, questions on that because... We got to see, you know, Barbara and Gregory spend time together um, and looking beautiful for Mother's Day, which is a very emotional day for the both of them. Yeah. Um, talk us through, you know, the the idea for that for that design, especially because, you know, as I said, the characters are very emotional and they're trying to maybe mask Barbara in particular, maybe mask some of her emotions with this beautiful dress. But, you know, what what went into that whole, you know, kind of set piece for that episode? Well, um, Cheryl, Barbara always wears a floral and we talked about her wearing a dress and we tried some and they just didn't look right because the characters, I mean, Cheryl in her real life wears beautiful dresses all the time, but they didn't look right for Barbara because she's worn pants the whole thing. So we, I just uh, was searching for some pants that look different and found that, found some, a few things, but that floral vest is something she really liked. And it did give, that's thank you for noticing that, some 
a little soft joy to a little sentimental moment. Yeah, and on the same episode, we have a drag brunch, which is so yeah. much fun to see. Yeah, that's a lot of see fun. Those characters do that. And I just love your work in that episode. So take us, talk us through the process of putting that scene together in particular, because that's a total departure from, yeah. I imagine, what you're doing, you know, day to day on, on Abbott. Well, that was, um, we got, originally, we found out it was going to be Shea Coulee and uh, Simone late-ish. We knew it was going to be a drag bunch, but we didn't know it was going to be these incredibly fantastic drag queens. So um, I just went searching for, we talked to them, Shea Coulee, who has a, had a lot of input in what she was wearing and uh, mostly, and then um, I went shopping and searching for anything I could and also trying to combine it in a, in a context to look beautiful fast because everything in comedy is fast. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, let's talk about Ava as well, um, because I feel like she's had a bit of an evolution this season too, um, especially in the premiere when she's taking her job very, very seriously. We have that great, yeah. in, in, you know, embroidered, bezat, bezat, bedazzled sweatshirt. Um, but how, you know, compared to all the other characters, what are you doing with her style that's so unique? Because she really, of course, has to stand out from the other teachers at Abbott. You know, Again, I try my, I start at trying to shop lower price points. So, so I go with what looks good in her body, on her body. And also, which she looks fantastic, right? She wears clothes very well. She looks fantastic. So, and, um, and whatever I can find at the moment. And at the beginning, we, we were more conservative, but she lost that pretty quickly and went back to old Ava. You know, it didn't, it didn't hang on too long. Yeah. Yeah. Um something else remarkable about this season is you've had some extraordinary guest stars. Yeah. Um, Bradley Cooper, Questlove, yeah. Kevin Hart. Um, I could name more and more, but I wanted to ask you, you know, when they're making cameos, either digitally like Kevin Hart or they're coming on set, yeah. how much of that that is their design choice because they're supposed to be as themselves in character? How much are you working with them on what that look should be? I mean, Bradley in particular, you know, has a has a great look in that episode. He brought that in himself. So he, the, and then, you know, I got him a rack of everything beautiful I could possibly find. And then he, or my shopper did. And, um, and he came wearing that and he wanted to wear it. So I just had to clear it really quickly. So he wanted to look like, I mean, he's from Philly. He wanted to look, he said, I would wear this if I was, you know, in Philly on the street. So I can't take credit for that. <laughs> and before I let you go, I want to ask you too, what, what is it like working with all of these extraordinary child actors? I mean, you know, to, uh, to, to dress them, it's just, you know, it's, it's so much fun to watch them and get to know them in bits and pieces individually. What is it like to work with them? It's, it's so fun. I mean, thank you for bringing that up because I always, there's such a huge part of the show and their adorableness is so, uh, so vital to this show, breathes life into it. And the, there are days when they're not there and it doesn't, we're on set and it doesn't have the same energy. And when they're there, it's a little crazier, but it's just really sweet. So it's, it's sweet. It's lovely. They're all so happy to be doing it. It's just an interesting experience for them. It's fun. And the clothes, are, you know, the uniforms aren't so special, but they're meant to be worn down. Yeah. And one other quick final question out of everything you've done that we've seen, there are a few more episodes left to see. Do you have a favorite look or two that you want to mention that you're particularly proud of that you thought came out, you know, particularly spectacular? I am. Um, such a, I really like the drag brunch, the whole thing, the whole Mother's Day. I feel like that whole episode turned out really well, fortunately, and that, you know, the drag queens are so beautiful themselves. And then I like the last episode, but there's a party, but we haven't seen that yet. <laughs> uh, Susan, thank you so much for your time today. Thank Thanks for you. It was fun. Thank you. Welcome to Gold Derby's costume design panel with Emmy contenders. I'm David Buchanan, joined today by Lou Eirek from Feud, Capote versus the Swans. Lou, I wanted to start by asking you, you worked on the first season or installment of this series, um, Betty versus, Bet versus Joan, um, which is just so fantastic. Um, what was the most unique difference or challenge between that you know, installment and this new installment, aside from you know, the time period, which is slightly different, of course? Well, Bet and Joan was truly one a highlight of my career, one of my favorite shows. Um, and I mostly produce um, for Ryan now. I don't really design that much. But when I heard about this one, I'm like, I think I might have to take this one on. Um, uh, and a chance to get to work with Gus Van Zandt as well. But um, I think the, the difference is that 
well, Ryan has been obsessed with the swans for as long as I met him in 1999. So I've studied them for years and then to get to work on it. And it was a whole different, uh, going from a Hollywood movie star perspective to this elite group of socialite jet setters uh, in New York, Manhattan at the time. And they were the original influencers, the original um, housewives. So it was fun to pivot uh, in about the same era. We went from 55 to 84, um, but, but to tell a whole different story from the Hollywood movie star to the New York socialites. That's a great point. And I wanted to ask you exactly that next, which is you have a very tight knit group of socialites in New York, but obviously they have to each have a different, you know, personality in their dress, even though they're very, you know, very tight knit and close. So how did you want to bring a kind of distinction amongst all those different characters, even though you're, you have to craft, you know, a very kind of cohesive, you know, group of swans uh, for the series. Yeah, you know, um, a lot of it's studying their personal lives, like each one of them have written a book or a memoir or someone has written about them. So we did have good research. And also Ryan Murphy is very specific about what he wants, but we kind of honed into something special of each one. So like, uh, CZ Guest was an avid gardener and equestrian, um, and she wore a lot of American designers. So we like really studied like the Bill Blass, the Jeffrey Bean, like tried to keep her kind of that all American look. Uh, Slim Keith was a, a California girl, um, didn't like frills, no fuss, no bows, just very a little bit masculine bent. Um, it says in history that she kind of influenced the look for um Oh my gosh, not Catherine Hepburn. Um, it'll come to me in a minute. But uh, kind of menswear as as a feminine, with a feminine touch. Um, and then for Babe, it was just this simple elegance. Like she could wear, you know, cashmere sweater set. And, uh, but for her, it was about the jewelry, like this, the signature jewelry that popped. For her, I, my word for her was grace. Like she always just had this grace about her. Um, for uh, Callista, who played Lee Radswell, we did a lot of um, more trendy fashion. She was the younger one of the group. She influenced Jackie and what Jackie wore in the White House kind of changed her look. She was just always had a finger on the pulse of, of what was happening and had personal relationships with all the designers at the time. So she was fresh and very styled. This is another incredible ensemble of performers. What is it like to go to work every day and get to work with Diane Lane and Naomi Watts and Tom Hollander, I mean, you know, you could, I, we could spend the whole 10 minutes naming some extraordinary people, but what is it like to collaborate with them and how much are they bringing to the style and sensibility of the character once they really get to know who they're playing? Well, um, I, I think everybody was as equally excited to do the project as I was. So we all came in with like, this is really exciting. Um, and I wallpapered, well, my team, we wallpapered the fitting room with images of each character from uh, when they first entered the socialite scene and all the way through so that they could as we're fitting we would have fun like striking poses just like they did and tom especially like we when we did his fitting we would take a picture of capote and he would we would style him and uh and we tried to give him his own flair as well as capote but it was really fun to watch it evolve uh, when we started with tom he was very slim. He was coming off of a movie he was shooting in London, Ireland, maybe. And he needed to put on a few pounds to look a little bit more like Capote in the 70s. So it was an interesting thing to start at when we started. And then he had to go away and do a movie. When he came back, he had put on some pounds. So we had to completely redo him. Um, but yeah, we collaborate. I love to collaborate. And uh it, it was just a gift, Diane and uh, Demi. And I had worked with Naomi before. I'd worked with Jessica before, um, but forms for new friendships for sure. It was a, it was just a thrill. I have to imagine. Um, I wanted to ask you about Capote in particular because he's such a well-known figure in popular culture on other you know, uh, depictions of him. How did you want to put your own stamp on the character, even though you know, obviously you're doing a lot of research, but what did you bring to it that, you know, you wanted to express your own sensibility on what, what he should look like? It was more, it also, it depended like in the fifties when he was just coming off of 
breakfast at Tiffany's and then in cold blood, like his becoming his own bit of a um, celebrity. He was at the height of his fame. And so kind of uh, really tailoring his clothes and, and making him look like he was embracing being a part of, you know, at lunch at La Cote Basque with the swans. But then as for us, as he started becoming, having a drinking problem and drug problem and started falling apart, making him working with Tom to becoming a little bit more slovenly and his clothes were not fitting well and we nothing matched and and uh it was probably picked up off a heap off the floor and it just him and I working closely with um how he how he would want to be in the scene uh, and not necessarily worry about what the research was just it didn't we didn't we stopped looking at the photos of Capote and what he would have worn and more how Tom felt he was stumbling into his fall yeah Something else else that's remarkable about this series is you cover a large span of time. I think, as you said, you're covering about 30 years. And in that premiere episode in particular, we're seeing, you know, bits and pieces of those, all those different timelines put together, which is just so extraordinary. How would you characterize what the differences in the style were from, you know, where you start to where you end? And how did you try to capture and relate those differences to the audience who, you know, may not be as intimately familiar with what the styles were of those eras? I would say um, 50, like we started mid 50s into the early 60s, there tended to be a style and a structure with the way, especially women dressed. Um, the hemlines were basically all the same. Everything was very tailored, prim, a bit of proper. And then uh, fashion started loosening up towards the late 60s, early 70s, and um, a lot more freedom in the way people dressed. Um, and the swans basically never really went too far from that other than um, uh, they would start, they started wearing more pants, but went from all, only wearing dresses into pants and never wore jeans of, in our show anyway. Um, but uh, also it's um, it, it, the perfection, the glamour, the elegance was all carefully cultivated in this lifestyle, but this was a time when the culture was splitting. It was a point where that world of elegance, ritual, and class was being replaced by Studio 54, disco, punk, uh, drugs, and it, uh, their, their lifestyle started fading out. Did that answer your question? <laughs> of course. And before I let you go, I do want to ask you about Babe in particular, because I feel like, as you said, um, incredibly elegant, but also I feel like wears her clothing like armor. Um, she really, there's one episode where she really is suiting up, you know, it feels like. So talk to me about how you approach that style, not just in terms of her elegance and refinement, but also how it kind of reflects her emotional state. Yeah, we kept it, um, her palette very pale, very muted and pale, like, you know, pink was maybe the most bold, um, and except in a flashback, she wore red once. But um, so we kept her, she was fragile. So we kept the clothes very uh, muted and a simple elegance. Uh, it was never flashy. She was never flashy. Um, I think it was just, I think a lot of it was Naomi bringing Babe alive as well. So we worked together and just keeping it very muted and simple and all, and the hair, uh, her her hairstyles were probably the most iconic part, but we tried not to have her costumes really stand out. Just keep that, keep that in a simple elegance and let her acting and the, the wigs tell that story. Did that make sense? Absolutely. Um, Lou, congratulations on Feud Capote versus the Swans. Thank you for talking to Gold Derby today. Thank you for your time. Welcome to Gold Derby's costume design panel with Emmy contenders. I'm David Buchanan, joined today by Carlos Rosario from Shogun. Carlos, I have to start by asking you, how much of a student or an enthusiast were you of 16th and 17th century Japan before you signed on to the project? And what was your process of acclimating to the incredibly rich history of this time period and region? You know, I've never done any project that was even remotely close to the Japanese culture. Um, you know, so that's why this project actually was definitely a treat for me to to be part of. But I think the first step to, you know, building the world of Shogun was to do research. 
So we did pretty much research from the first day to the last day. And we were in touch with um, a teacher um, at the University of Kyoto, Frederick Quince. And he was the one that really guided us from the beginning to the end. So I think by the end, we put together like a 1,000 page book of, of research. It was a complex you know, world to study because we had the no theater scene. We had, you know, the, the weddings, funerals, and every single character is of different ranks. They go through their own emotional, you know, journey. They go to different locations, are facing different circumstances. So it, we needed to really know this uh, period as much as possible. And what we did in the beginning was to study the paintings of, of that period because that was the only you know, reliable source that, you know, would really tell us what this period of transition, the Sengoku period was about. So I didn't want to watch any Japanese movies of this period because I didn't want to see this period through the eyes of any Japanese director or Japanese costume designer. I really wanted to go straight to the point. So um, what we did is really mostly studying those paintings. And in those paintings, we had to, you know, um, you know, sort of study the colors, the patterns, the symbols of the patterns, because everything means something, right? And so that was really helpful. Yeah, it's remarkable hearing how much research went into it. And that's kind of what I wanted to ask you next, which is this is such a massive and epic series in every sense of the word. How much time did you have in terms of your prep between when you signed on to the project and when you had your first day of shooting, like how much time did you have to just craft and get your head around everything that that needed to be accomplished? So we had about five months of prep, a little bit less than five months. Uh, so that was pretty ambitious. Um, you know, like I said before, I didn't know anything about, you know, Japanese culture uh, and this period. So we had to start from scratch. Um, the tricky thing was that actually I needed to design all the armors within the first six weeks of work. So that was very ambitious because we needed to do all the research for all the different armors, the different ranks and the armors that the Lords would wear, which are very different from, you know, the regular samurais. Um, and so, you know, that was very ambitious. So for six weeks, I had sort of five illustrators working day and night. Um, actually, the Five of them were in five different time zones. So that was even more tricky. And so we had to do all the, you know, uh, all the drawings, all the research, have them actually approved by um, the historians, the experts, you know, and then, and then also, of course, you know, present everything to the directors and the showrunners. So that was pretty ambitious for the first six weeks. We wanted to put everything into the manufacturing as soon as possible so we could actually have those armors ready for the first day of shooting because it's always like that on every project. Somehow the most complicated costumes always end up being shot the first day. So I focused on that. And once I was, I put that into manufacturing, then I started focusing on my other characters, you know? And so that's when I started sort of conceptualizing uh, the costumes for everybody else. In that very quick development process, um, did you return to the source material at all, the novel? How helpful was that to give you insight into the characters? Um, and then how much did you wanna say, okay, I've learned this, let me return to the script and then just do my own thing as well. Yeah, so that's a very good question. I, you know, the intention in the beginning was actually to read the novel. That was the intention. But I got so busy since the day one that I just didn't, never got to it. Um, and in a way, I think it was the healthier way to process designing this project. I wanted to start from a, you know, sort of fresh white canvas. So I didn't read the book. I also didn't watch the miniseries from the 80s. Um, I wanted this project to have its own voice, right? And so we had a great leader, our, you know, showrunner, Justin Marks, had a very specific vision. We were working with very knowledgeable Japanese actors. And so, you know, it was really my, I'm very perceptive when, when I work, it, it, for me, I need to be in my flow. It's it's more about, it's more of an intuitive process. I need to understand the historical facts, but after that, connecting with my characters is mostly psychological. So I didn't want to have any mental references that would attach me to the novel or to the miniseries from the 80s. 
Yeah, it makes a great deal of sense. Um, I want to ask you about one of our central characters, Mariko, um, just a stunning performance uh, and so beautifully designed. And I wanted to ask you specifically about her color palette, because we see a lot of steely, you know, kind of icy blue colors. And then occasionally we get beautiful, you know, pops of, of brightness. Um, you know, what was the intention with the colors that you were using and how does that really express, you know, her mental and emotional state throughout the series? Yeah. So Mariko, actually, I mean, our three characters go through a very different emotional journey. And um, Mariko, to me, was the one, because to me, she's really sort of the heart of the project. She really has a very specific, you know, emotional arc. So I needed to read the 10 scripts to understand where she was at and where she needed to go. So I, you know, the idea with Mariko is actually the creative force behind the costumes for Mariko is actually more psychological than actually, you know, historical. So it's the only character out of everybody else that I focus more on the emotional and psychological aspect, more the historical facts, because I needed to respect that emotional arc. So in the beginning, because of studying and understanding who this character was based on the fact that her and her family were dishonored, um, and, you know, she walks in the world in a way that, um, she was forced to marry Buntaro. Um, she tried to commit seppuku every year um, during her birthday, but they wouldn't allow her to do that. So she lives a life without, you know, lifeless, you know, sort of life, I mean, without heart. And so I needed to um, portray that through her costumes. So I started with very, a very monochromatic, very simple, very white sort of color palette because it was about sort of portraying that her life, her costumes are the extension of who she was. And so I wanted to show sort of like the uh, her costumes um, representing winter. And so that's why the first pattern of the first uchikake that she wears is actually the snow covering the grass. So it's very black and white in the beginning to represent that at that moment, she's almost like a ghost walking, you know, and as she finds her path and her purpose in being Blackthorn's translation translator, and, you know, she has this assignment that Toranaga gave her, slowly I could see that this character was sort of starting to... Um, empower herself, find her inner voice, you know, and she, the fascinating thing about Mariko is that she was ready to go all the way. And so as her evolution progresses, I started incorporating more colors, you know, the camellias are actually blooming on her costume, right? And I started adding more patterns. And so that was sort of the emotional arc of of her costumes. But what was really also interesting is that white is the color of seppuku, is the color of death. She started with white, but I reused some of her costumes from the beginning in the end, because I felt that as you empower yourself, empowerment is not a straight line. And so I needed to bring her costumes from the beginning, because in that empowerment, she was also, you know, facing her fears. And so she knew not only that she was closer to death, but also that she was facing her fears as she was expressing her inner voice. And so it was important for me to bring the elements from the beginning to the end too. Before I let you go, Carlos, I want to ask you about um, something you mentioned earlier, which was the no theater, which is just an incredible scene, beautiful work, beautiful masks. Um, how much of that was sourced? Like, did you create those masks yourself? And how did you approach that differently than, you know, other aspects of the series? Okay, so for the No Theater, that was one of our biggest scenes and the ones that took us like months to design. We ended up designing all the costumes for all the audience, which was complicated because we had all the lords and all their families. So we had to make all those costumes. In terms of the, the performers, the three performers, the No Theater costumes are actually passed from generation to generation. So we actually had three performers from Japan coming to Vancouver and, um, you know, to perform the scene. And so they wore the costumes that belonged to um, generations of families, of their family, right? And so the only thing that I did um, for those costumes was actually just incorporating certain elements that have, because some of those actually characters are Lady Ochiba and the Taiko. So I had to incorporate some pieces that I designed myself for my characters in real life and sort of put them into those costumes so the audience could actually distinguish who they were, you know? So that was my involvement with the performers. But, you know, what I really mostly designed was, was the, uh, the rest of the audience. 
Incredible. Um, Carlos, congratulations on Shogun. Thank you so much for talking to Gold Derby today. Thank you for having me. Welcome to Gold Derby's costume design panel. I'm, I'm David Buchanan, and I'm joined today by Bernadette Croft from Star Trek Strange New Worlds. Bernadette, I wanted to start by asking you, Star Trek has been so beloved for so many decades. What was your um, kind of relationship to the material before you signed on to these newer iterations and, and series? Yeah, I guess I would say um, I know of Star Trek through my mom. She was a really big fan of the original series. Um, but I didn't really become a fan until I worked on the show. I was actually at an ACD for Gersha Phillips, who did Discovery. And then I ended up being the costume designer of Strange New Worlds. And it was just a lovely kind of, um, you know, history of, of the importance of Star Trek, how much it means to people. I've been to a few conventions and seen fans dress up in designs that I've created and designs that Gersh has done as well. And it's just so um, heartwarming to see how much um, it really impacts people. Um, so yeah, I guess I'm now a full-fledged Trekkie. I love it. Um, but yeah, there is, there's a lot of content. It's been around for about 60 years of, and I think it's like over 800 hours of, of Trek. So it's a lot. And we're, we're going to keep contributing to that, which is which is cool. This is the second season of Strange New Worlds, and I wanted to ask you about how the characters and your designs for them have evolved um, from season one and season two, and how, how you're capturing you know the emotional arcs of these characters over time in a new season. Yeah, season one was all about establishing these characters. Um, the Starfleet uniform is a really important um, element to the show. So that was a lot of um, research and development. We wanted to have a really clean, kind of simple uniform, but lean into the nostalgia of Star Trek. So those colors, those that vibrancy, um, we elevated it in a way. We added the microprint, which is um, a texture that's um, a silicon kind of um, texture that's on the shoulders and the arms in the, um, in the departmental symbols. So it was just a, a cool little nifty thing that we did to kind of, um, you know, create visual interest. Um, we know the fans would really enjoy kind of recreating that at home. Um, and yeah, still maintaining the sleekness. We elevated the silhouette, made the shoulders a little sharper, a little bit more superhero. Um, and I think in season two, we just continue um, kind of like developing the characters and their emotional kind of story arcs. Each um, episode is like a new genre, a new world, or, or a new alien species. So it's always um, fun and exciting and thrilling to be able to kind of, um, you know, be on this journey with the characters. Um, in episode one of season two, um, our team land on this new planet called Kajitar. It's kind of like a little rough around the edges. They're, they're in this marketplace. There's people buying, stealing, trading this um, this material called dilithium. It's very, very um, valuable. And the dilithium is mined. And so we wanted the the whole team to kind of be coated in this, um, this kind of like uh, this residue. So it's kind of like a muted gray metallic residue. And yeah, it's just like making things look really lived in, real. Um, it's always fun to, yeah, dress our our heroes up in um, disguises as they land on these worlds. And even the background department, we've got a, an incredible team and they always make the background artists look so incredible because you never kind of know when a background artist is going to be featured or they might interact with like a main character. So even um, in, this, in, in this episode, every single background artist looks like they had a little story of their own. You know, there was like a tattoo artist. It was like this guy with like a tank of electric eels and this woman who had like a stall of perfume bottles and like secret little oils and stuff. So it was just really cool to see um, how our hard work really pays off in these big episodes. That's exactly what I wanted to ask you next, which is I have to imagine every time you open a new script, it's just so exciting to see what you'll be doing you know, this this week, um, just, you know, remarkable diversity in the stories and, and the worlds that you travel to, as, as you're saying. So what is that process like for you? I mean, number one, how fun is it to see what new challenges are going to have script to script? And then how much time do you have to prepare to, you know, bring our characters, you know, into places we've never been before? 
Yeah, it is really, um, it's just a joy. It's, it's an honor. It's so amazing to be on a show like this where it is so creative and it does come down to the scripts. It comes down to the minds of our writers and producers and directors and um, them trusting us to do our job. We don't have a lot of time. We've got like two weeks per episode to prep and we're also wrapping the previous episode and then looking ahead to the, the next episode. So it's like there's a lot going on and especially if we're like doing an episode where it's really gritty and rough around the edges and then the next episode could be, you know, uh, Vulcans and they're, you know, in their finery and everything's, you know, tailored and immaculate. So it's like, I love it though. It's like, it's really great to be down, dirty, and gritty, then have this like fashion moment. And then like e each episode is something different. So it's always, it's always amazing to be a part of. Um, I think the design process, it comes down to um, meetings with our producers, writers, directors, um, doing mood boards. I use Canva and um, Pinterest and just kind of like collate images that I think would work for the palette, for the silhouette, for the, for the textures, the tones, um, and just like watching other shows, um, watching other films, photography, even the gaming world has a lot of inspiration for me and nature. I just like love collecting um, images of insects or underwater creatures or things that might have like an alien quality that we can kind of like explore, you know? So um, yeah, there's a lot of work involved, but I think the team um, that I, that, you know, we, we, we have really helped um, bring the vision to life. And I really lean on their skill set to, um, kind of um you know ma make these like crazy ideas that i have come to fruition it's really it's really cool to see something else i wanted to ask you is of course there is some expert prosthetic work on this series um so what is it like to collaborate on for example the klingon with your prosthetics department and also with your hair and makeup to create a really cohesive and beautiful you know character with all these different departments having to collaborate I love it. And it, it's like, it's so important to be on the same page. Um, often prosthetics start a little earlier on characters, especially if they have to do a full prosthetic, you know, head to toe, they, they have to start building this um, well in advance. So we often um, take their lead and look at their palette, look at their skin markings um, and figure out, you know, who the alien is, their socioeconomic background, if they're, you know, if they're fashionable, if they're, if their clothes are, you know, rough around the edges or, you know, who their family is, their religious beliefs, their cultural identity. We look at all these things and figure out how are we going to build a world? How are we going to um, flesh something out to make it look believable? Um, and the Klingons were really fun to kind of like sink our teeth into. Um, in the original series, the Klingons were pretty, they were pretty basic. They were like um, these, this gold stretchy top with these black stretchy pants, um, not a lot of detail, but that's what, that's what it was like back then. And although it's like kind of funny now, it's still like we got to pay homage, pay respect to kind of like um, what was done before. So I think my job is to, you know, bring it to a new audience. And for me, um, kind of elevating that look is about the silhouette and the textures and, um, yeah, making it just infusing a lot more detail. So our Klingons, we have this like exoskeletal um, uh, kind of like armor and that was hand sculpted by Alex Silverberg, our key sculptor. And then it's like foiled and painted. Um, our key artist, Anna Pencheva, is remarkable at her skill and she makes things look like metal and she adds enough patina to make it look worn and like battle weary, you know. So we just, yeah, we had a lot of fun um, with the Klingons and again with the prosthetics. They really lent into the nostalgia of TOS, but did a better job. They made it look more realistic and, yeah, more grounded, I would say. Before I let you go, Bernadette, I have to ask you about the crossover you've done with Lower Decks this season. Um, how exciting was that to get to take these really delightful animated characters and bring them into a live action series and design those costumes? 
It was so fun. I I must admit, I I'm a fan of the show, so I was like low key very excited to to work with um, Tawny Newsom, especially. Um, she's so funny, and she brought like this, you know. She's just like really good at um, ad lib comedy. So every take, there was um, you know a different way she would tell a joke or say her line. But um, yeah, it's interesting. It's it's we still wanted them to look the, the costumes to look kind of like two D. So we didn't add our usual texture to it. We just kind of let it lay flat, and we added like um, kind of like a like a liner um, that made things puff up a little bit. So there was no wrinkles. It just kind of like I don't know. It had this like two D quality. So yeah, with the with the different techniques we used, it was really it was some fun R and D to kind of get those um, proportions correct um, and yeah, bring these uh, animated characters to the human realm. Finally, do you have a favorite look from the season? If you had to pick one particular design from the episodes and, and your favorite characters, what what was the one that most stood out to you as your most proud or the one that took the, the most work and you're happiest with the way it turned out? There's so many episodes that like I love from season two. Um, I love the Vulcans. Um, I always love Vulcans, the, the tailoring, the the way we can use that beautiful fabrics. Um, and I, I, but I must say like the Klingons were a real highlight. I think the fans really um, were very pleased that um, we didn't stray too far away from the original concept and that, you know, original idea of the Klingons. So building that armor, making it look a bit more intimidating, graphic, um, memorable. Yeah, that was a real um, highlight for, for me and the team. Bernadette, congratulations on Star Trek Strange New Worlds. Thank you for talking to Gold Derby today. Thank you. Welcome to Gold Derby's costume design panel with Emmy contenders. I'm David Buchanan, joined today by Sharon Gillum from The Wheel of Time. Sharon, this season of The Wheel of Time is in many ways so much more expansive than the first season. So I wanted to ask you, when you saw the scripts and you heard what the idea was for how the world was going to expand, what were you most excited to sink your teeth into and design? Well, I had never worked on a show of this scale before, so um, the whole thing was um, a big, exciting project for me, to be quite honest. Um, <clears throat> Uh, similarly, actually, it's interesting listening to Carlos to what he was saying was um, that his first project or the first part of the project was creating the army. That's that's exactly what I had to do um, when I started the Wheel of Time, because um, they were finishing off season one while we were prepping season two. And the Shanshan army was the first thing that I had to create. So. And Rafe's brief was, um, can you create an army like no one's ever seen before? So um, it was like, okay, this is the right at the beginning. This is what I have to jump into. And um, it was very exciting. It was such a big project and I'd never worked on a fantasy show of this scale before. Um, so I was really, I was just determined to enjoy it, I guess. I was determined to just make the most of it and really push the boundaries, have some fun, you know, just experiment, actually, which Rafe really encouraged. So I think, you know, like in a fantasy show like this, fantasy, fantasy shows are fun. You know, you can really push your ideas and you can push boundaries. Um, I think we were just very lucky to have a showrunner who was so open to experimentation um, and you know that's such a gift to a costume designer it's the wheel of time is based on a series of books which are very big have a very big fan base so um, that's very important to acknowledge um, also within the books um, Robert Jordan the writer was very very specific about these different cultures he wrote a lot of detail about the way things look so you've got loads of source material to work from, from the books. Um, and then you've got um, various other sort of, um, um, what do you call them, sort of um, subjects or like 
uh, boundaries that you have to work within. So um, each of the, the the world is divided up into um, a world that has a map. So we had a map of the Wheel of Time on our wall in our office. Um, and each each nation within this map um, is has is a mix of two cultures from our world. So, you know, you've got the books with all the information. You've got this idea of one of the cultures, Kyrene, was French and Japanese. So you have, you take from French reference from any period, any period you like. You take Jap some information from Japanese reference and you mix it together and you very respectfully, without any cultural re um, appropriation, you create your own look for a, for a whole an entire world um and that is really really incredibly exciting um to to work with to have all that information um you can, yeah you can take you can take things from any period in time and the only thing that you have to um bear in mind and keep which kind of keeps you grounded is that everything has to look as if it was made before the industrial revolution so, you know, if you have prints, they have to be look like they're screen printed. Um, things have to look as if they were made by hand, etc. So you have this amazing melting pot of ideas, you know, references, places you could go. And you have to sort of really find a way to not just completely like lose your mind. <laughs> you know, you have to just find a way to kind of um, make start making your world into something coherent. Um, so it was incredibly exciting. Yeah, you picked up on something I wanted to ask you about the Shan Chan Army because they are have the most just exquisite headpieces, those metal face coverings. I mean, just some beautiful work. And I wanted to ask you first, what was the inspiration for those looks? And second, what's the process of making them, crafting them, and then bringing them to life on screen? Because they really, you know, it's so evocative when you see those characters um, come on screen. Yeah, I mean, the Shan Shan was the biggest culture for season two, and it's probably the one that most spent most time on because they have such an impact and they have to be, you know, very dangerous looking and threatening and so on. Um, the Shan Shan world is a mix of um, Mesoamerican and Chinese, Imperial Chinese. So the obviously the references, you start doing a lot of reference for that, um, pulling that together and then um, there's also in the books, it says that they have, um, they they look like insects. Um, and I wanted to, I sort of extended that into reptilian textiles and textures and so on. Um, and, um, uh, and the, the color palette for them was, um, mid the sort of Mesoamerican influence, um, because we didn't, some of the first designs for that sort of had feathers and so on, but it just, became too much cultural appropriation. So we use the color palette from there and they also come from the sea. So I use this idea of like rusted metal as the colors of their entire culture, because like I was saying, there's all these different cultures and you have to understand where the characters are all the time in the world and in the story. So to give each, each culture quite a strong and clear color palette was really important. Um, and then I wanted to sort of like deform their bodies a bit as well. So, so like the the Death Watch, which is the sort of elite guard, um, have this, and the and the Suldam, who are these women who control women who are soldiers, have this sort of carapace thing on their back. Um, so it once I got going, like we all do as costume designers, you know, you you start taking ideas, and then it all starts to make sense. And as you go down the line of developing the 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 culture. Um, things that you thought you didn't think you'd ever use suddenly come into play. Um, and then Lady Suroth, who is the the kind of, I thought was the queen of the Shan Shan, she comes in at the end of episode two and in this pewed palanquin and the director, Thomas Knapper, wanted her it to look as if she was, he, his reference was um, Elizabeth Taylor as Cleopatra in a film from the 60s, where he said, watch this. And it was like, it takes seven minutes for her to arrive on screen, seven minutes of screen time. Uh, that's the idea behind this character. And um, 
so the the she has this sort of big mask like a mask headdress with like mandibles and a stinger coming out the front um and it's that's also to do with um her costume and her face covering and her second in command's face covering is all about the power of the voice and being able to how you use your voice to intimidate people she doesn't speak she has someone who speaks for her and then down the line, as we were developing the, the women who they control, who the Damani, um, I put this gold stopper in their mouth, which was actually a reference from a Mesoamerican pre-Aztec image that I found. But it met, it all made sense in the in terms of it's about it's about who how you who speaks, what power they have, and taking away the power of speech and what that does to a person. Yeah, Sharon, um, congratulations on extraordinary work on the Wheel of Time. Thank you so much for talking to Gold Derby today. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much. Welcome to Gold Derby's costume design panel with Emmy Contenders. This is our roundtable portion. I'm delighted to be joined by Susan Michaelick from Abbott Elementary, Lou Eirick from Feud Capote versus the Swans, Carlos Rosario from Shogun, Bernadette Croft from Star Trek Strange New Worlds, and Sharon Gillum from the Wheel of Time. I wanted to ask a question to all of you first, which is, I have to imagine the most one of the most exciting parts of your design journey is the costume fitting, when you get to take things that you've put on paper and then brought to life um, with fabric and then put it you know, on your performers and see how it comes to life and see what they bring to it. Um, I wanted to start with you, Lou, and just talk about you know, what is your most favorite aspect of that fitting with your actors? And have you had any kind of aha moments or discoveries when you were in the fittings for this series in particular? Well, there were many, um, I'm trying to think, maybe uh, with uh, probably with Jessica Lang when she was playing Capote's mom and there was very little information on her. So we were trying to decide who she would be. And Ryan had a specific thing, like it's a flashback to her before she committed suicide um, and so we had a rack of all kinds of stuff and and uh, we just started playing dress up and trying to figure out who Nina was. Uh, that was probably one of my favorite moments. And then, oh my gosh, maybe with uh, Demi as well with Anne Woodward coming up with the, uh, there was a fantasy scene and we weren't quite sure what it was and we just started playing dress up and came with it. But both of them not at all period specific. They didn't have to be because they were fantasies. So I think that was uh, for me, my favorite because we didn't have to go strictly from the period catalog. Carlos? Well, for me, I mean, for Shogun, my feelings on Shogun were very different than any other shows that I've done before because it takes about two, three people to dress anybody with any of those costumes for about 45 minutes or an hour. So, you know, actors are busy. We had so many things to do to get through. Um, so pretty much I had one shot. I had 45 minutes, one hour to try the costumes that we made. And, you know, and that was, that was pretty much it. And I think that what was beautiful about it was the fact that I've never worked, you know, before, um, you know, representing this um, this culture, the Japanese culture. So it was really beautiful to see all my characters, you know, sort of come to life as I was, you know, sort of trying all this um, all these outfits. But it was very different than any other shows that I've done, where usually I get to play with different options and and different elements. On this one, we only had one shot. You know, we could only try one thing, and that was pretty much it. So it was a different process than than other shows. Bernadette? Yeah, I guess um, every alien is cool, every Vulcan, but even the Starfleet uniform. Like, I see even our day players come in, and um, it's very powerful. Like, you know, when you put on this uniform, you're going to be a part of a team that values life and diversity and thrill of science and adventure and I feel like they stand a little you know I don't know it's something about their cadence and their posture it makes people walk with confidence so I would, I would say like that that legacy of the of the Star Trek franchise um, um, has a real effect on people and, and I see it every day here it's really cool. Susan? 
I, it would have to be with Quinta for this season with the transition and just bringing a ton of stuff in and whittling it down with her and uh, seeing who how we could shift the character and how it evolved. And Sharon? Um, well, I was talking about it earlier, but the Lady Suros um, headpiece, we had the, a design, an illustration, and uh, Rob Goodwin, who's my amazing couture leather maker, had created the basic shape. But he was like, how do we make this visor thing? Because we wanted to hide her mouth, her face. Um, and in the workroom downstairs, somebody had found at the, in a box at the back of the cupboard, um, this piece of metal that's like a kind of bowl. It's like a fruit bowl that folds in. So like a, um, a piece of metal with lots of holes punched in it, like a fruit bowl. And I was like, whoa, what's this? And I took it into the fitting with Karima, um, who plays Lady Suroth. Prima McAdams and Thomas, the director, and we sort of laid it across the front and we just went, whoa, this is, Thomas said, I've never seen anything like this before. And uh, to his credit, to everybody's credit, they went with it. This is the first time you see an actress on screen and we've completely hidden her face, a beautiful woman, and she wanted to go for it. It was really, really exciting. Let's pick up on the point you just made on working with leather. I wanted to ask each of you what your favorite fabric to work with, either on this project or on other projects, what is your favorite to work with and why? I know, Carlos, uh, you're shaking your head. I know you worked with Japanese silk on this project. Um, do you want to talk about that or what? what yeah, are your sure. Favorite? Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, obviously, we, you know, we worked with beautiful fabrics. We started swatching the fabrics in Europe and in America, and I couldn't find anything that represented the aesthetic of the Japanese culture. So we ended up hiring a team in Japan that sent us the most beautiful fabrics. Um, so that was really a highlight, you know, um, that FX was so supportive that they allowed us to afford those fabrics that were kind of unique, right? So that was really some highlights of, of this project. But I think actually, I really love to work with leather too. Um, and I actually made all the armors in leather um, because I knew that it would give a really nice patina to uh, to the armor, uh, more depth, but also it would make those armors much lighter. And so usually armors on samurai movies are made out of metal and you know iron and all that. And I decided to go the other way and um, make it in in leather. And actually, Mr. Sanada. Um, told me that that was the lightest, you know, armor he has ever worn in his career. So that was great, you know, for him and all the other actors that had to perform their stunts. Anybody else favorite? Anybody else love working with leather? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, I, I had quite a big leather department and I'd same as Carlos, very similar. You know, you can make leather look like metal, which is magic. Um, and um, and it does really help, especially stunts, you know, to so that they don't they they can't possibly it's too dangerous, too heavy to to use the real thing. But I was going to say that I also um, I did a lot of uh, buy, buying in Europe and actually for well, this time in India. But um, I really like getting vintage textiles because of the life that they have in them. Um, the Wheel of Time, even though it's a fantasy fantasy show, is quite grounded as well. It has a reality to it. Um, and one of the things that I love doing was I would buy a piece of fabric that's this big and then take it to my amazing textiles department and go, um, do you think we could reproduce this and then print 20 meters of it so we can make it for that character? And that's a real treat to be able to um, create your own fabrics, um, you know, developing either something that's reproducing something vintage or taking that idea for a walk and going from vintage into something completely new and that's again that's just an incredibly luxurious thing to be able to do on a job. Lou you were shaking your head working with leather. Uh, uh I, I, yes but I actually was something that I like to work with that is so simple and don't laugh but I love how it can transform anything is the shoulder pad. A simple little shoulder pad can shift a whole you can see an actor like, oh, I don't like shoulder pads. And you know, hold on. And you, it, it changes the way they stand. It gives them boldness, a powerfulness. I, I think it's really funny. You can build it into the peplum of a dress. And I don't know, I always have a huge stack of shoulder pads of all sizes in my fitting room. Susan? Well, 
I purchased everything for the show unless it's scripted. So I don't have, you know, I'm more about color and print and what I can find than creating anything for this particular um, series. Bernadette. Yeah, I, I guess I love seeing the textiles team create. So often we have to make fabrics look weird and wonderful and alien. So it's like, how are we going to, you know, do a custom screen print or add foil or texture? So I, I find that the team adds all of this like um, life to, to the fabric. So we have so many different types of fabrics here, but I do love the natural fibers and, and leather in particular because of uh, versatility. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's always fun to experiment here. Before I let you all go, I wanna ask you from these projects in particular, do you have a memory of one day on set where you had a costume issue and how did you kind of come in and, and save the day um, so that production could continue? Um, Susan, let's start with you. I think there are costume issues almost all the time. I mean, <laughs> there's a fire almost all the time and there's just a readiness that you have to have to fix it. So I don't have one particular one. Speed, agility, a good crew. <laughs> you know? Anyone else? We had a hand-painted uh, gown for a uh, babe for her 1955 Thanksgiving dinner. And uh, you had, you know, you guys all work in bigger custom made, but this was a very delicate hand painted dress. And we had one time to hit it right and then make the dress. And the next, they were shooting it the next day and they came and asked, anyway, you have a double because we're gonna like sew this thing into it. And then uh, we had to quickly whip up like a, Luckily, we had, had done a painted test to make sure, but so yeah, it was kind of like, how do you just whip up a custom made couture dress, all hand sewn by by noon? But we did it. This is what we do. <laughs> exactly, always asking for the impossible and expecting it to really happen, and somehow we do it, and <laughs> then they go, you "See, you can do it." We, my, okay, my quick story was, um, there's a character called Lan Fear, who's a sort of evil um, dominatrix type woman from the future, um, who's seducing one of the young main character. And she had to, she's, there's various scenes she comes, she appears in them, um, in his dreams and in unexpected places. We were shooting in Morocco on top of a hill um uh, in the early hours of the morning um and she had this sort of black leather dress that was quite fetishistic and so on and we made this headdress that was pointed sort of up like this in horn in a horn shape it was made of card um laser cut card um and <laughs> it was so windy on that day that her headdress was like a sail um and she had to hold on to it and they somehow they managed to shoot it and somehow they managed to edit it. But the first AD, when I saw him the next day, just gave me such a filthy look um, and just said, how could you do that to me? How could you put that thing on her head that could have ruined the whole day? And the director turned around, um, Maya Avrilo, and she went, yeah, but it looked great, though, didn't it? <laughs> Carlos? You know I can think of, of of one. The only thing that I can think of is the fact that we needed to um, create some openings in the hakama pants for, you know, all our gentlemen. <laughs> so they could go to the bathroom and that would speed the process. Otherwise, you know, in the beginning, it's something that, you know, with the rush of all the costumes that we needed to design really fast, we didn't think about. And after one day, we realized, okay, it's time to create those openings in the Hakama pants because, you know, like I said before, it would always take like 45 minutes to redress, you know, somebody so we couldn't afford any any mistakes, you know. I burned it. Uh, yeah, I guess similar to Lou, just like... um needing to do a double at, at the last minute. Um, season two, we're in the times of COVID and we just had to be ready for anything. And one of our costumes, it was like an elaborate Vulcan dress with filigree 3D printed shoulders. We had to kind of reproduce very quickly. Um, the actress was fine in the end, but it was just one of those things we, we had to do just in case. And um, it always pays to have extra fabric, you know, just in case these things happen. Cause yeah, you never know, you have to be prepared. 
Finally, I'd love to just ask each of you quickly, what is it like to work with each of these shows in, in, in its unique way has so many background performers, uh, whether it's all those children at Abbott or these armies in Shogun, Wheel of Time, um, so many background, big, big gala scenes and other shows. What is it like to work with um, and costume, you know, dozens, if not hundreds of background performers? What, how is your approach um, to that to make it as seamless as possible? Go ahead, Carlos. There, I'll go first. Um, you know, I mean, I we wanted Shogun to be as an experience for the audience, right? So it was really important for us to be as accurate as possible about the Japanese culture, um, but also, you know, sort of always find ways to bring it to the modern audience. But, you know, in order for the audience to really have a very immersive, um, you know, um, sort of experience, watching the show we needed to treat every extra um in the same way so as as the lead characters so we put a lot of work and effort into designing the background exactly as you know with the same passion and the same hard work as our lead um characters susan how about working with all those uh children we talked about that a bit earlier yeah we kind of touched on it i mean they're just adorable and they get to put they're wearing these uniforms which we've broken down to age and then they have pieces on top or shoes and they get to put put it together however they want and also wear it however they want so there's a realism to it bernadette yeah i feel like i i love being a collaborator and i have two incredible um bg supervisors and they they run their fittings and they send me pictures and options of um, of every single BG performer and I get to choose my favourite. So I very much love to um, pass on that kind of like responsibility to them just because we often have 100, 200 background performers and I really want to make everyone feel like they're contributing to the show. And, yeah, I, I very much like to tip my hat to the team because they're incredible artists and the BG performers um, really, like I said, mentioned before, just like add that kind of like that depth and um, that believability. So very, although sometimes they're not heavily featured, they just add so much to the episode and the experience. So very grateful. Lou? Um, I'm very hands-on with background fittings and this, uh, this series, we had an incredible team of, of background. They had a lot of fun doing the fittings. I always enjoyed going over to their side of the hall and, and watch them create their magic. But we had a very small budget. So the challenge was how do you do a uh, Lakote Basque, a uh, very socialite heavy restaurant and and on a limited budget, but they, they pulled it off. And I was always in awe of how our limited stock and they were able to make it look magical every day. And Sharon? Yeah, I completely agree um, with what everybody's saying. It's like your team is everything. And, you know, on this, these big shows, you cannot possibly do everything yourself. You really rely on people's um, creativity and skill. Um, you know, you start it off, but then you let them take over. And I think there's something so exciting about seeing like um Lou just said um you know just just seeing the way that people it really get into it and it's like oh this is why I'm doing this job um you know not just because it pays the rental for whatever reason it's on my CV it's because I really love coming to work and creating those characters and that's just um you know it's so great to be part of a team like that well, congratulations to each of you, Sharon, Susan, Lou, Carlos, and Bernadette on these beautiful projects and beautiful costume work. Uh, thank you all so much for talking to Gold Derby today. Thank you, David. Thank you, thank thank you, you very much. much.